Everybody, today is Sunday, March 17th, and we are bringing you Block Digest 165 at Block Height 567,528. What's going on today, everybody? Hey, hey, man. It's been a uh, beautiful, hectic morning out here on the front range, but sounds like uh, I guess everybody's, maybe everybody's doing a little bit of St. Patty's Day celebration. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some of that going on in uh the downtown city area but not so much around here maybe later so uh yeah how's it been going with you this morning janine no far uh, alternating between working and binge watching something <laughs> yeah we, we don't have st patrick's celebration either i guess the st patty's day thing is more of a uh i guess that's another U.S. holiday. An joke. illusion, Michael. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, binge watching, huh? I'm trying to avoid that. There's, uh, I don't know. I've been avoiding Netflix and Hulu and all that stuff. I've got so much stuff I'm trying to handle in the background. Is it because you've made a huge, tiny mistake? No, not at all. I think uh, I think I know what you're referencing there. About one of the stories a little bit later. No, so, I, I'm 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 very thickly hinting that there's a new season of Arrested Development out, and everybody should binge watch it. <laughs> oh yeah, I did see you say something about Arrested Development was coming back. I mean, geez, this is like what season number? It's it just seems like too big a break in between, like. Michael will look like he's, I mean, Jesus, he is like 30-something now. <laughs> Don't like the drawings. Okay, you cowboy bebop hating cock. All right, you guys are all over the place. Uh, cowboy bebop and Arrested Development and all these. Uh, let's let's binge into these stories, man. We got, like, I was surprised that we stacked up this many stories. So let's start getting into them. What's the first story today? All right. Well, uh, the first one is just a quick update, obviously, because I am paid by Blockstream Core to always cover Blockstream related stories first. But uh, in between now and the last episode, the Blockstream uh, Lightning Messaging API has switched over to Mainnet and is officially live and costing real money now. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's been alive for, I think, like around a month or so now with the testnet variation, but now the tinkering for free is done. And so, honestly, I am really kind of interested to see how this, like, it evolves now that things have actually shifted to, you know, real monetization. I know, like, some of the first things people were doing with it was like sending memes. We've had Grubles uh, receive a rare Pepe through it. And we had the uh, anonymous Eastern European developer effectively start using it kind of like a public micro blog um, right off the bat. That was kind of interesting, but you know, now we're shifting into the realm of a real market and i think this is really when interesting things are going to happen like this is one of the first dynamics that i kind of brought up when they announced that they were going to launch this product is like this this creates a market for truly anonymous communications and we've never really seen a a, a market where you have to pay per message for a service like this. And so we've never really seen 
any kind of price signals to really give us an accurate view on like how highly people value a, a service like this where you can truly like communicate anonymously through the the entire world without creating a social graph to analyze and you know i think it, more, more than just like what kind of interesting things are people going to do with, with this service but how are the users in the market actually going to price these things like which types of use cases utilizing this api are going to be highly valued enough to really survive and remain viable when e each use of it is really subjected to the bidding pressures of a free market and i think you know now that we've actually made this transition we can actually start to see what evolves and comes out of this due to that market pressure and not just people kind of tinkering with things because it's it's just test nut coins that don't really cost anything and so like i i'm really excited personally to see this shift uh, in the environment and what actually comes of that yeah i mean you know every time these blockstream stories come out it's something that is going to be a uh, pretty evolutionary for the space and uh this one like you're saying it's pretty paradigm shifting in the way that you know it can change the way people send out messaging without having to be grafted you know a graph showing like where this message came from and who who said it and what's their sentiments behind this statement and everything that comes along with that and yeah it could create this entire service industry that could uh you know like we've been speculating in the past as far as um you know, emergency transmissions and news feeds like that from areas that are going through times of distress where it's hard to get actual intel on the ground out and have it being confirmed that it's not been whitewashed through one source or another to try and paint a picture. And uh, I mean, I think we're seeing that, uh, you know, right now in Venezuela, there's a lot of uh, discussion about what's going on there. And, you know, oh, well, that looks like it's from this side of the spectrum or that's from that side of the spectrum. And it's hard to say like where, what is the actual stories coming out and is this a bunch of actors coming together and just trying to paint this picture? I mean, it could be a lot more accurate if we're getting out information from a live feed like this uh, from a satellite. It just seems like it could be a, a one-stop shop for people to just sort of drop in information from one of these emergency areas to say like, okay, this is what the picture's looking like. And, you know, we could draw our own conclusions, but yeah, it's hard to say how exactly that's going to get built out. I mean, like we're saying, this thing just went live uh, a couple months ago and now it's available for anyone to use. So yeah, we'll see how it builds out and it should be like we're saying another one of these uh, paradigm shifting things that Blockstream's working on. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, you can go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. It's really interesting, isn't it, that Blockstream is working on so many innovative things. Like, uh, wow, it's, uh, it's it's scary. I would never be, I would never dare to do that with Wasabi, for example. Like, I would rather sell t-shirts and sneakers and things like that uh, if we would have to diversify something then then do something other innovative things because even one thing is is, is hard enough but on the other hand if if someone can pull this off then that's gonna be rock stream <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know some it's like this really like is gonna wind up i think being a, a double-edged sword because i mean like yeah this on the one side is something that anybody can access who is able to actually pay the, the market price for a transmission but you know if, if we really look at like how this this whole satellite network is structured in the first place i mean the, the benefit is though the wide reach the the potential privacy broadcasting through this for messaging purposes and mostly the the kind of scaling costs where like you can have a hundred thousand new people receive through this and it doesn't cost Blockstream a penny more. And like that kind of thing is very useful for people in, in very bad situations that need to communicate like people in oppressed, you know, regimes or countries. But at the same time, 
Like it's it's not just people trying to get the truth to people in a, an oppressive regime that would want to utilize something like this. I mean, like one of the things people really kind of like to gloss over a lot with something like Tor is yes, that, that does help a lot of people in a lot of bad situations. But at the same time, that's also something that's utilized by intelligence agencies that that's been put forward as, as a means of encouraging propaganda. That's effectively one government uh, trying to interfere in the, the activities or existence of another government. And while, you know, the satellite communication system is definitely brings a lot of good to the table, like at the, at the flip side, like it offers another means to accomplish things like that. And, you know, we're, we're going to see because of the way that this is structured, like how the market plays out. I mean, like what is going to be the the more consistently paid for service what's going to be the highest valued thing is it going to be something like uh, a venezuelan trying to actually spread legitimate information that is entirely truthful through a place like venezuela or is it going to be something like the u.s government attempting to spread misinformation and take advantage of that situation through propaganda and like we're, we can't really know until use picks up and we actually see how the market prices those different things yeah i agree we have to provide neutral platforms right so anyone can use them and we we will see how they are going to be used in the future for sure it's gonna spur out an interesting you know another market to see like yeah where exactly who exactly wants to use this satellite the most and i imagine just like from funding and everything we we'll probably will see you know yeah people trying to push their narrative down onto a country but i'm just thinking about you know some of the major investors in lightning or twitter and spacex and it just makes me think of it as satellite competition where we might actually start to see more people building out these uh satellite nodes in this service with their own sort of messaging apis that also builds out just a yeah, a competitive sensor resistant speech platform, but that's heavy speculation on my part. It's we're we're pretty heavy there in the speculation on this point. Well, I mean, that's that's been one of my hopes since this was first announced is that more companies would start providing services like this. I mean, like th this is a brilliant thing. Like it, it's incredibly scalable and efficient. It's completely private for people receiving it, but it is a centralized thing. And to really, you know, make infrastructure like this more robust, you need more people providing things like this. You need more companies from different geographic regions providing the, the backend satellite infrastructure so that it's more difficult to shut things like this down. Yeah, Solar man. flare. Solar flare. Yeah, Bitcoin is meant to, it's like, I just some of the most interesting discussions have always been like, you know, the space currency, like how are you going to, you know, transmit value between Mars and Earth? And like, there's just like a larger game at play here. And yeah, I imagine we will see that satellite competition build up because, you know, the market is evident at this point that we need censorship resistant platforms because it's getting absurd in the uh, in the level of censorship to try and maintain free speech. And uh, that's like one of the core tenets of Western civilization. So, you know, if uh, we want things to continue in the route of uh, diplomacy and things like that, then yeah, we should. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see this all built out. Mm -hmm. So I guess any last comments on this one? Who knew what is uh, where are we at next talking about this? Uh, this bill in Texas got shut down pretty quick, huh? Bleep, bloop, bloop. Yeah, so pretty much like this looked absolutely um, insane. And, and the, I mean, like they, this, there is just no rational way that you could really look at this and approach uh, the situation as if this bill was rational. So um, one, Caitlin Long, 
um, went to Texas to kind of discuss this issue and talk to um, Phil Stevenson, the sponsor of this bill, although he ended up refusing to meet with her effectively. But as well, um, but I'm sorry, one second, I spaced and forgot this guy's name. Um, okay, well, um, o OGBTC on Twitter, who is the CEO of Mocket Esports, um, had apparently reached out to the Texas House director um, in their legislature and pretty much was told that this bill is dead on arrival. So like they, they, there, there is no way that this is actually going to pass. And in, also in response to this, um, he was told that the, the Texas legislature would actually like to hear from Bitcoiners the types of things that they would like to see in regulation. And so in the tweet where he kind of spoke of this interaction with the house director, he was actually requesting from the, the overall ecosystem, the types of things that they would like to see. And, you know, two of the biggest things I saw were, I mean, obviously like this kind of KYC overreach is kind of insane, but also a lot of people encouraging them to look at the kinds of regulations and laws being passed um, in Wyoming, um, with the help of people like Caitlin Long. And you know, given the fact that she was, you know, actually willing and did go to Texas to try to uh, explain why this bill was completely counterproductive, I'm, you know, tentatively positive that the, the state government in Texas is actually going to look at things from her perspective and the types of laws she's been passing and hopefully consider going down that same road as opposed to you know, things like this crazy KYC bill. Yeah, you know, politicians know their stuff, right? They listen to people. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least in the US, it certainly seems like that they they listen to the people actually more than other other parts of the world. So that's that's good. Well, I know that it hasn't been, you know, shown that much in uh in the narratives being played but for sure the voter still has the power to vote those people out and put someone new in and we've seen some stark changes in uh political offices here recently just because of uh people's positions that they've been following a long time based on narratives built out of dc and the coast while uh you know they're at the home the uh constituents were really upset and uh we saw some people really, you know, start to reflect on the fact that their realities didn't reflect the realities of their constituents. And so, yeah, I mean, and Texas has always sort of taken this, you know, independent stance to where people know their congressmen down there. They know their senators on a level that I, I haven't really felt elsewhere. And I mean, uh, you know, those people are put into power from their constituents. And if their constituents feel like it's time for them to go, I think uh, people in Texas you know, there's parts of Texas that are near the border where politicians, you know, they have to face up with the cartels. It really is a huge area and diverse and, you know, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, politicians will listen to their constituents if they're really upset. That's why it's still pretty effective to start these campaigns that, you know, call into congressmen's offices and senators offices and flood their phones and flood them with letters. And it's a, uh, as long as it's right and point, you know, it's on point and uh, they understand that that's something their constituents want, then uh, you'll see them change position. And it was good to see that change here on this Texas legislation because this stuff was crazy. I mean, yeah, we need to push back on all of this. Anybody that wants to be a, uh, you know, an independent American and have their rights restored that have been taken from us over the past few decades. Uh, yeah, you should be pushing back against all of this legislation. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess any, any more comments on this or should we shuffle along? No, let's move on to, to another legacy conversation. All right, Rick. Rick. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so shortly after the show ended this past Thursday, I saw a post from I Am Nomad on Twitter, and it 
kind of took the wind out of me. It was still a little surprising, but I think I know what's going on here. First off, uh, yeah, shout out again to I Am Nomad for uh, not only breaking this story on Twitter, but also the Conbay story too. And uh, so as we can see in the show notes, the CBOE released a document titled New CFE Products Being Added in March 2019. And unfortunately, under the XBT column, it states no new contracts. In fact, this is the updated version of the document because an earlier release did show contracts to be listed this month with a final settlement date of July 17th. Well, now those contracts won't be listed and the, exist and the existing contracts will be allowed to expire with a known replace without a known replacement, which if we look at their website, we could see the last contracts expiring on June 19th. So uh, there was a statement made in a notice to customers of the Chicago Futures Exchange saying, quote, CFE is assessing its approach with respect to how it plans to continue to offer digital asset derivatives for trading. When it considers its next steps, CFE does not currently intend to list additional XBT future contracts for trading, close quote. There has been plenty of speculation since the announcement that this had to do with the contracts continuously lagging behind CME's volume. The most recent report showed CME daily trading volume at around 4,700 contracts, while CBOE was only uh, a little around, was close to 2,100 contracts. So there were some major mechanical differences in these products being traded that could, that could have led to this dynamic. First off, the CBOE contracts was a daily auction that uh, ended at 2,100 GMT to be uh, settled by the Gemini exchange, while CME contracts were based off of uh, live price feeds from the spot market on I mean, an index of exchanges, which included Bitstamp, GDAX, ITBIT, and Kraken. And uh, there's also some subtle differences in the timing of the contracts and its availability. I think the uh, biggest issue if, is that traders are trading the CBOE contracts. They are trying to trade on volatility. And here recently, Bitcoin has been stable enough to aggravate the most seasoned arbiter. So uh, there was also a major difference on marketing where CBOE was first to market and assume that base on trade and assume the base of traders would show up while CME has been actively advertising and targeting traders. So I really think this is just a small hiccup in the road for CBOE contracts with Bitcoin. I think they're just sitting back and rethinking the mechanics behind the contracts and what would fit best for the market. In the meantime, I'm sure we'll get a good amount of FUD saying this is some sign of weak market structure, but I don't think so. This feels like a group of people that dip their toes in the market and you know they're seeing where the water is warm and uh, what looks best and they're gonna head in that direction. So that's my speculative speculation. So for now, the CBOE contract is uh, set to expire in June. Are the they're the last we'll see of the Bitcoin futures on the CFE? But uh, yeah, I think we'll see a new contract with uh, different mechanics sometime later this year. So, uh, but that's what I'm thinking. I don't know. What do you guys think of this story? Yeah, I think it's mostly those issues, and then just like there's a lot more stuff traded on the the cme market that the bitcoin futures are traded on so i mean like because the, these markets do you effectively kind of have to pay to access and trade on and given the the much wider selection of things that you can trade on the cme in addition to bitcoin futures i mean i think that's just pulled most of the volume in like traders are going to go where they get the most bang for their buck and you know like you you said with the the cboe like the most traded thing there is a volatility index and if you're not trading that then you're effectively paying for access to that market just to trade bitcoin futures whereas on the cme like you can get access to a lot more like you know tradable things if you're not already dealing with the volatility index Yeah. And I mean, that volatility was looking really crazy at the end of 2017. And I mean, if you just had a futures market on that volatility, uh, you know, it did look like people would flock in there. And it's, yeah, just a little unfortunate that this volatility and the whole bull run kind of got uh, shut down. I mean, fortunate, unfortunate, however you want to look at it. And uh, 
I think legitimately there's lots of different places to set up different contracts. We're seeing that with back and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's the volatility index is on legacy stuff, but um, I'm just assuming like, uh, you know, people were like we're saying if they're on the CB CFE, they're trading volatility and just Bitcoin hasn't been that volatile recently. But either way, like I'm saying, I think they're coming up with some sort of different contract, just like something because there's like the back contracts and then there's all these other different contracts, the contracts from the uh, six exchange in Switzerland and just people are building out different things based on different mechanics of the system. Yeah, like I, I don't think this is really going to have any kind of effect on like the overall market, it, like especially like, you know, the CBOE and CME stuff. These are just like cash settled futures. So it's not really dealing with the underlying and we still have things like backed launching. And I think if that's successful, you know, we'll start seeing a lot more uh, of these companies getting involved and in looking for actually physical settled products instead of these cash based ones. They're cash based ones. Yeah, the market is evolving. So, uh, any more comment on this, or should we go back to our favorite punching bag? Okay. I will take that as a key to sign along. Alrighty, so Coinbase is making a number of different changes to GDAX, which I will continue calling GDAX. I don't care that they want to call themselves Coinbase Pro. So starting March 22nd uh, at 6 p.m., they're going to be implementing a new fee structure, a new... Uh, order maximum, a new um, increment size, removing an order type, as well as adding um, market order protection points, which I'll get into in a second. But pretty much the, the fee structure is, is shifting mostly because maker fees at you know this time are, are pretty much just nothing. Like it, it's zero fees to trade and this is actually something a lot of people even people not actively trading have been using because you can simply port um if you have a coinbase account you can just quickly open one on gdax and you know a lot of the more savvy people have been going there to purchase bitcoin as opposed to directly through coinbase and, and paying all the fees involved and so Traditionally, like how these things work is that you have the maker fee and the taker fee. And uh, the maker fee is generally much lower because that's, that's effectively you are adding an order to the book that is not going to be filled right away. So you, you are effectively adding liquidity by entering an order and waiting for the market equilibrium to come to you. And this is done to kind of incentivize adding liquidity and even in some cases, like it's not really dominant, but sometimes makers are actually paid money by some exchanges um, for doing this after certain volume levels um, instead of just having a 0% fee. And a taker fee is generally higher than the maker, and these are pretty much market orders. So you're not putting an order at a specific price and um waiting for things to come to you you're you're effectively just buying or selling at whatever the current market price is that will execute immediately and so you know this i i i don't really see anything particularly hinky or or weird with with this specific change because i mean this this is pretty much standard procedure for exchanges like this kind of fee differential is how you actually incentivize liquidity to keep a, a functional market going for lots of traders. And so pretty much um, starting uh, the 22nd, anything under 100K is going to pay a 0.15% maker fee and a 0.25% taker fee. Um, 100K to a million is 0.10 and 0.20 respectively. 
1 to 10 million, um, 0 0.08 and 0.18, 10 to 50 million, 0.05 to 0.15. And then pretty much anything above 50 million on the maker side is going to be a 0% fee. So you're not actually paying fee for putting in um, limit orders after that point um, instead of taking market orders. And then from there, um, 50 to a million or 100 million is 0.10, um, 100 to 300, 0.08, uh, 300 to 500 million, 0 0.07. Between half a million or half a billion and a billion, it's 0 0.06. And anything over a billion, you're going to be paying 0.05% on the, the taker side of things. And so this is um, pretty much, you know, the, there's. Like I said, there's nothing really shady or manipulative here. Like they, it's not really practical for them to have zero fees across the board in, in perpetuity. Like they're they're a business, and that's not really viable in the long term. But the these next things, I think, are all pretty much are at, attempting to kind of limit what market participants are actually allowed to do. And the, the first thing is the updated order maximums. And so pretty much what they're, they're doing here is re refusing to allow any orders over a, a certain amount to even be placed in the book. So for Bitcoin, you have to have a minimum of 0 0.001 Bitcoin in an order, and you are not able to enter in a single order more than 70 Bitcoin. And so this is pretty much trying to, in my opinion, manipulate markets. Like you're effectively saying like you are not allowed to buy or sell more coins in a single order than this at a time. And I, I think, you know, the, like this is, is really par for the course with legacy markets, but it, this is like, it, it's pretty fucked up in my opinion that you're telling somebody what they are, are not allowed to do with their property, like how much of their property somebody is actually allowed to sell. And, you know, when you look at that with the, the next thing, updating the tick sizes, that's the difference that has to occur in price between orders. And so when you combine the maximum order size with the requirement that there has to be a difference of at least one cent between orders, you know, when you're talking about somebody trying to deal with massive amounts of money, you're creating a non-negligible amount of slippage that they have to deal with the, the more volume that they want to either purchase or sell. And so you're, you're, you're effectively kind of limiting the market and telling it what it's not allowed to do. And that's very distortionary for things. And then the next thing is, is deprecating stop market orders. And so a stop order for anybody who doesn't know is pretty much when you, you set an order, but you don't actually put it in the book. You set like a certain price. And after that price is reached, then an order is actually submitted to the books. So you, it, it's pretty much something when there's a sharp movement and you want to do something, like if the price starts going down to sell or buy or vice versa, you would use a stop order. And they're completely removing the ability to use stop market, which would be effectively like just dump or buy the entire size of this order at whatever the market price is, which is, you know, a big dynamic that leads to quick price swings in the market. And again, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there who think good, but that is, again, like you are telling somebody what they are, are not allowed to do with their property in a way that is going to have financial consequences for them. And the last one is market order protection points. And that's effectively for any order that's a market order, which would just execute at whatever the current price is, there, if it moves the market more than 10%, then they just stop it. Like it will not finish completing. So you're effectively preventing somebody from buying a massive amount of Bitcoin if it will move the market too much or selling a massive amount of Bitcoin 
if it will move the market too much. You're effectively preventing people from entering or exiting their investment position when they want. So like if the market started tumbling down and somebody wants to exit their position to protect themselves financially on Coinbase, you will not be allowed to. If your order will push the price or help continue the movement downward too much, you will not be allowed to sell and exit your position. And that is just unbelievably fucked up and unethical. Like you are effectively forcing people to realize financial consequences based on what you will allow them to do. And that's just fucked up. Yeah, if uh, I don't know if there's another reason to delete Coinbase for that bigger market share that people were like, oh, these people, they don't really matter. They're just like small fry Bitcoiners. It's like uh, this, you know, like you're saying, I mean, it's pretty much entrapping a bunch of market makers and uh, seeing what if they'll follow along with Brian's will. And uh, yeah, Coinbase, Conbase is just going to funnel these cons down your throat and now uh, you're kind of forced to stay in this position. I mean, uh, it's been ridiculous. I think that these guys have actually started to move on to the position of like being the next polo. I've been seeing recently. It's like polos volume is ridiculous ever since they sold out to uh, sold to uh, Goldman. And now uh, it's like, there's what's, what's the next polo. I mean, like, uh, you know, people are kind of speculating about what it is. I mean, like, it feels like Conbase is the next polo, but it's already heavily KYC'd and it's trying to make these people work together in some weird fractional reserve system where, you know, I mean, like we're seeing in the chat, you know, we got guys that can't even withdraw nothing but $100 a week at Bitcoin. It's like, what the hell is that? Are you talking about Polonia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, real. Real quick, like um, in the chat, Vlad just pointed this out and he's dead on point. These types of things are going to help shit coins more than anything else because they are with less liquidity in smaller markets, more subject to these kinds of wild swings that these alterations to market rules will prevent. So what do you mean by Poloniex got bought by Goldman? Wasn't it bought by Circo? Yeah, but Circo was bought by Goldman. Oh, all right. And uh, what do you mean by it's, their volume is ridiculous? It's ridiculously low or ridiculously high? Low, low. Ever since the sale, it's just been waning to the point to where now <laughs> it's like behind <laughs> the smallest shitty shitcoin exchange. I think it's like 99 or something high in the listing. I'll check real quick. Nice. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is like, this is just another example of, of Coinbase trying to restrict what people are doing with their property. And ultimately in the way that this will play out, play protectionist for all of the shit coins that they're trying to pump and get people to buy, which, you know, if we don't, have any more comments on this i think is a nice time to jump into the next one um if you want to take the that yeah, if you want to take off with that jenny yeah so in addition to that news coinbase has also recently been emailing users to encourage them to convert their bitcoin into a basket of various or i don't know if it's a basket but they're basically encouraging people to convert into other altcoins that have been obviously tragically underperforming according to the overinflated expectations of pump and dumpers. And you can see the screenshot of this email from Stop and Decrypt. I don't think I have it up with me, but it basically just says something like, are you curious about other coins? You can convert your Bitcoin into, you know, various other coins very easily. Um, now, to me, this isn't surprising at all. Um, and I would say that together with um, the previous story, this seems like a predictable move in terms of Coinbase running an exchange business. And in addition to their previous launch of basket offerings of shit coins, which hilariously have, um, I think there's even a live chart that shows you um, how much money you would have earned or the value that you would have earned from buying that basket a year ago. And it's almost always when I've seen it, it's been in the negative 
which is really hilarious. It's like, oh yeah, buy this basket of underperforming assets. Um, of course, as a non Coinbase user, I don't know if at any point Coinbase was warning people that they were emailing about the risks of converting Bitcoin into various altcoins. I think converting is even the wrong word to use because, you know, I mean, when I convert coins to paper cash, that's a conversion. And I guess you could use that if you're converting to another currency, but there's different risks and, you know, baggage that comes with converting even to other altcoins in some countries. Um, some countries consider that to be a taxable event and others do not. So anyone who does take Coinbase's advice and pursues their quote curiosity about uh, other coins, they would um, they would need to be made aware of those potential consequences, including, you know, the fact that, as you guys were saying, there's more volatile price fluctuations that Bitcoin um, than even Bitcoin, and they could potentially lose that value altogether if whatever cryptocurrency they convert into doesn't survive in the long term. But of course, Coinbase is not financially incentivized to be cautious. Their incentive is to generate as much activity as possible so they can collect fees, even if that means just swapping back and forth between various shit coins on their platform. Well, see, like that's, that's I think, the key difference here that makes this incredibly malicious and not just them acting in their financial interest. They don't make money for crypto to crypto transfers. When they introduce that feature, it has zero fees. And notice how they specifically say, convert your Bitcoin into these shit coins and not just they're available on the platform. You can purchase them. Like they're, they're entirely trying to convince people to dump their Bitcoin for something else that they have no profit incentive to do. They don't make money off of these crypto to crypto transfers. Like this, this is entirely an ideological push to manipulate people that they do not see a financial gain from. Like this is again, more shitcoin protectionism. Yeah, I mean, if they're not making any money from fees of converting to other currencies, then they would probably, I mean, who knows what kind of deals they have with the various foundations or developer groups that are making these coins. Obviously, there might have been something going on when they were listed, or they might just have personal relationships with them. And so they're being incentivized to, you know, get adoption quote uh with these other coins that are basically failing and have almost no actual use cases so if they're not making money from the fees they might just have some kind of background deal to encourage people to hold it because then they can go back to those people and say hey look x number of our users are now holding this coin they traded it for their they traded it in exchange for bitcoin um but it also i mean who knows, they might even be doing this as, as a way to get Bitcoin back um, to, I don't know, maybe they want to hedge their, they, like they know that these coins are failing and so they'd rather hold Bitcoin and, you know, pass off all of these bad altcoins to their users. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. Then that is them being unbelievably shady as fuck, manipulating these markets to their customers' detriment for their own benefit like that that would be a million times worse than just ideological bullshit and trying to undermine bitcoin yeah well considering what happened with delete coinbase and the fact that they literally hired hacking team or, or should i say former hacking team i really like my expectations for them doing anything ethical are very very low yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, just a quick update on that whole movement. Have we heard anything else about a timeline to get those guys out and who's leaving? Um, I haven't seen anything. I haven't checked in the last day or so, but I, I assume that someone would have pinged me if something did come up. Um, the only update is uh, I think I saw something from Fluffy Pony that a website, uh, Coinbase.lol, was set up 
to link directly to my tweet thread about it. So that's funny. If you want to like go, if you want an easy way to share my thread about delete Coinbase, um, I think it's the original one, not the second one that I made. Um, it has most of the information and source links in it. Now there's like a website to get you, you there. You should add a link to the second one at the bottom of the first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that movement is going to continue. And uh, like you guys are saying, this is getting ridiculous for all levels of their customers. I mean, uh, you know, they're just really ignoring everything that had to do with the stuff that got them here to where they're at. And um, yeah, like we're not uh, we're not giving up on that. I want to see timelines. I want to see that when it's happening, make sure all the names are out of there. And I mean, I, I still kind of doubt they're going to do that for us. I mean, they're just going to be like, yeah, we got rid of them. Yeah, I mean, the and the thing that was interesting to me while that whole thing was happening, just as a tangent, is because we're talking about Coinbase and altcoins and everything. The only, uh, like, it was mostly Bitcoiners who were speaking out. Um, I saw maybe one or two people, like prominent people from Ethereum, but mostly people in Ethereum I saw were either completely silent on it or they were actually like, deriding people who were boycotting Coinbase and were saying, oh, this is just ideological Bitcoiners. Like, yeah, ideological Bitcoiners who care about human rights, buddy. Um, but besides Bit mostly Bitcoiners, I would say there was also Monero people. And obviously there was um, some Ripple people as well who were kind of upset that it had trashed their uh, listing event um, and maybe contributed to the whole Coinbase effect. But really, there I did not see a lot of support from people in altcoin spheres. I mostly saw it in Bitcoin and maybe Monero and Ripple in a very weird way. But like really not from Ethereum, not, I mean, I guess Litecoin. I didn't particularly pay attention to Litecoin, but it was just interesting yeah, to see. From Charlie Lee, actually, he was, yeah. he was mentioning that uh, how, how could Coinbase do something like this? Just, just drop it in. Yeah. So I, I just thought it was interesting to see like which, which. I mean, I don't know how much, because you know some of them are already listed on Coinbase, some of them are not. But I wouldn't be surprised if the people in those um, altcoin spheres were, you know, not willing to criticize Coinbase as much either because they didn't really care about the values of why we were getting angry at them about hiring hacking team people or if it was because they were scared that if they got involved in the backlash that that would affect their relationship with coinbase and possibly the listing of their coin um that would be really disappointing but yeah i just thought it was interesting to see that i think it's the uh whatever the former or the latter there whichever one is like they were afraid of coinbase's backlash because uh i've seen many of these ethereum guys in background discussions get real upset about this and um they were also very much against this idea of you know surveillance and you know this is where some of these guys i think they're in here for the right mindset that i talked to but they just don't understand how exactly we get this market efficiency that does bring us greater human rights and uh and yeah i mean it's crazy but i mean yeah for sure monero guys they were with us and in that whole discussion where it seemed like they were very outspoken about it and all the guys from uh the magical crypto friends you know yeah whale panda charlie lee fluffy and uh samson they were all talking about the delete coinbase movement and how stupid it was and um you know yeah charlie lee used to work for coinbase and he talked about how it was something where somebody needs to pull brian aside and and tell them what's going on because yeah it does seem like they're only working now with this idea of these wrangled market makers that they have set in these uh you know these institutional investors that have heavily speculated on ethereum and bitcoin cash early on and put them all in a ring together and said all right now you're going to work with us or else or else we're going to delist you or else we're going to you know penalize you or whatever or you just can't move your fund well, Charlie already got Litecoin listed, so he doesn't need to be on their good side anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listed and sold at the top. All right, Charlie. No, but I mean, like, he's been recently, you know, being vocal about Litecoin's development. And um, I'm sure, you know, he probably 
you know, definitely picked up some more of his position and, you know, he's a, seems to be a smart guy overall. But yeah, like, uh, so what else is going on? Where are we at next? Rick, the TikTok clock. Take us into the next one, Janine. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, I forgot I was next. So um, three days ago, a Bloomberg tech reporter, uh, Yuji Nakamura, tweeted that Mark Carpellis was found guilty of tampering with financial records related to the whole Mount, Mount Gox blow up um, several years ago. Uh, but he was cleared of the embezzlement charges by the Tokyo District Court and received a sentence of two and a half years in prison. However, Yuji said that the sentence has been suspended, meaning that he may not actually serve time in prison. And two days ago, the Japan Times confirmed that the report of the sentencing was correct in terms of it being two and a half years and said that his prison sentence would be suspended for four years on the basis that he had no prior criminal record. They say the court also ruled that it was not possible to determine that Carpellis embezzled funds from Mt. Gox clients because the company did not have a proper accounting system in place for when its executives borrowed money from the company, uh, a common arrangement in smaller, medium-sized firms or privately owned businesses without accounting units. Um, I believe it was also said that Carpellis, um, unless Carpellis commit, commits another violation within the next four years, he won't need to serve the sentence at all. So if he does anything naughty in the next four years, then he would have to serve the two and a half years, which really seems low to me. But apparently, according to Bloomberg, um, Carpellis has complained about unfair treatment by Japan's justice system, which has a 99% conviction rate. In interviews with various media, Carpellis had said he was interrogated for months without a lawyer and bullied into signing a confession a nightmare process during which he lost 77 pounds over 11 months. Yeah, really? I mean, I, I don't know if I would call it, I mean, I'm, I'm an anarchist, but whatever. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily call this unfair in the scale of like possible sentences and treatment he could have possibly received considering the huge magnitude of the crime he was involved in and what or was potentially involved in but was not proven due to his poor accounting practices uh i don't know if i would really call this unfair and he you know two and a half even if he had served two and a half years that's pennies considering what like i think there was even a woman uh here in or in the u.s who um she was sentenced to i think five or ten years just for casting a ballot when she was still on probation, which isn't allowed. Um, so that's pretty insane. So I don't really feel like he's in a position to complain when, you know, because of his shitty work, so many people lost money and it's had, you know, this has been the biggest, you know, bad news item on Bitcoin since like several years. So I don't, I don't agree with his reasons for complaining really. Yeah. And I mean, even if you want to argue about like the conditions he was held in, I mean, this is not the country of his birth. Like he immigrated there. So this is a totally different situation when you want to argue about the legitimacy of a justice system. Like he was not born there. He was not forced into this. He chose to move to Japan and in doing so agreed to be pretty much, you know, under the rule of that legal system and subject himself to that legal process. So like, I think that's another thing to point out too. Like he voluntarily moved there and agreed to abide by that country's laws. It's not the same as somebody being born in a country and effectively being forced into complying with a specific legal system. Like this is something he agreed to tacitly voluntarily. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, like you're saying, I mean, he definitely got put in some harsh conditions for a short period of time. But uh, yeah, this was kind of surprising. I figured that he would at least be going to jail for another year or two or, 
you know, some short amount of time, but this is something that, you know, like, I've, you know, I don't come from the financial sector, but I've heard about this. And since I've gotten here, this is one thing that I've just, it's just evident is like financial crimes don't really have much, you know, legislation there to hold people accountable. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, room there to just sort of say like, well, yeah, this or that. And, you know, it's, it's as bad as he job he did, he was definitely responsible for a lot of bitcoins. And like we're saying, those bitcoins, they're still kind of in different court cases. Like you got Brock Pierce saying like, well, no, he owns Mt. Gox and you have the Gox trustee and how exactly all those coins are, are split up and where they all are. I'm sure there's enough financial backing behind him to yeah make sure he doesn't see a jail cell. And uh, I guess that's just the way it turned out for now. And I mean, ultimately, like the fact that he has had his sentence suspended, I mean, I really don't see what he has to complain about. Like it's the the court has decided at least that it was not an intentional malicious fraud. He is like, I mean, this, this is, you know, generally something a lot of legal systems do where they will suspend a sentence if they see a lack of knowing malicious intent. And if he winds up not serving time in jail, like I don't see what you have to complain about, Mark. Like you effectively got off scot-free in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean, it was major negligence, but I guess, you know, at the time of sale, as we've seen from this expose on Gox recently and uh, everything through these podcasts that, you know, it's uh, it was a nobody really knew what they were doing. Everybody was negligent. There's not any more comments on the Carpellis thing. I'll take us into canon. Go for it. All right. So going back to the tales of the IPOs, it's uh, it looks like Canon Creative has just closed a new round of funding that has raised hundreds of millions of dollars, bringing the company's overall valuation over a billion dollars. This is according to the Chinese financial news publication Securities Times, which uh, for some reason their server is down and I'd like to see some secondary sources on the story, but I'm, maybe it'll come back up. According to the Securities Times in China, the company sold 9,727 units in 2015 and a number and that would grow 30-fold to 295,000 in 2017. Its 2015 sales generated some 7.1 million in revenue and 2.25 million in net profit, and uh, its sales would take in 193 million in revenue and 53.8 million in net profit. So uh, you guys know Canon are the number two competitor to Bitmain, and that Bitmain and Ebang are going head to head for that Hong Kong IPO. The last time we talked about this was that eBang story where the company said they were determined to meet their annual sales goal of 400,000 units this year. And uh, that was in episode 160 of the Digest in uh, just a few episodes back. In that story, I had talked about how Canon had allowed their IPO application to the Hong Kong exchange to lapse. And uh, that happened back in early in November of last year. Now, earlier this year, back in the beginning of January, uh, the South China Morning Post reported that people with knowledge of the matter said Canon Creative is considering listing in the United States after shelving plans for a Hong Kong IPO. So it looks like they're eye in New York at this point. And uh, it looks like, yeah, some more good news for Bitmain competitors. And uh, right now it looks like Bitmain will be unseated sometime this year as the number one mining company in Bitcoin. I mean, this, uh, you know, like you say, with the eBank story, and now we got the Canon story, and we've been talking all the way about how Bitmain's problems have been rolling out from a few bad decisions late 2017. But uh, what do you guys think of this story? I mean, I think it'll be interesting if they actually are able to pull off a listing in the U.S., given how the situation's playing in Hong Kong. And, you know, I think they could continue to eke out in existence, but, you know, I've, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here. Like, I just, I don't think in the long term that these kind of consumer facing mining businesses are really 
going to survive in, in the long term, at, at, at least not at the, the scale that they currently are. But, you know, if they're able to manage their finances properly and not try to overexpand to a crazy degree like Bitmain, I mean, like they, I mean, they could potentially wind up surviving and pivoting to a more vertically integrated model if they kind of adjust as the, the market situation continues changing. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of hard to tell what, what, what these companies are really thinking about in the long term, because there's just so much concentration on the short to medium term, as far as a lot of, you know, the public outreach and statements. So. Yeah. I mean, like, you're right. It does feel like we're uh, beating a, beating a dead horse there with a uh, bit main, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've, for sure could see like some of these bigger companies trying to figure out a way to play this uh, long-term game. And that's like, you're saying it's all going to be built out with electricity contracts and local governments. And, you know, we'll see if they uh, start actually going that route and steer away from this retail side of the market. And uh, yeah, it's the mining industry side of things is real, you know, it's real fast paced and it's hard to measure what exactly things are going to be like as far as the uh, development side of things in a few years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, I just, the, the, the more like we see efficiency gains in chips, I mean, the longer hardware overall is going to be economically viable, but you know, I mean, that does, it doesn't completely remove the room for like retail level miners, but I just, I don't think it will ever really, achieve like a large portion of the network you know i mean even when hardware is is pretty much totally commoditized with very long operational horizons most people mining at home or at a very very small scale not like actually managing farms i don't think it will really make sense unless you are doing it in combination with some other use like, you know, we, we've seen farms in Canada that are actually repurposing the heat for hydroponic farms. There's a lot of small scale miners. Like one of the most common things is using the mining machines to actually generate heat and subsidize your heating bill. And I, I don't think that things like that will ever completely go away. But you have to think about how big that consumer market's going to get. And the fact that... I mean, like, look at the dynamic going on in China right now. Like, we're seeing a huge re-expansion in the Sichuan province due to the rainy season coming up and hydropower becoming available again, but almost everybody's buying used mining equipment. And so the, the longer a specific piece of equipment is going to be the most efficient or efficient enough to operate, I mean, the less likely you're going to have a high throughput in that market and that that applies to like somebody heating their house with a couple miners as well so i mean it's it's really just like we we have to really see how these markets evolve like i like they're they're not going to go away completely but it's still a question as to like how viable that market is for a company to concentrate on and how big like they can reasonably expand before they overextend themselves and you know, can't function as a profitable company. Yeah, I'd say that's probably some of the most interesting side of the whole marketing equation of the mining equation is like if you can, you know, use this excess heat to, you know, spur another market to where you're kind of playing a few different sides of one coin and you're just making the most efficient use possible out of the electricity you're using. That's where, uh, you know, Bitcoin can do some amazing things. We might see some of these guys out there with some uh, some of these retail miners in their homes and they're building out these new systems that make it, you know, to where it's pretty much free of charge or something to use these things. And whatever you make on the side is just added income. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's, uh, I mean, did you guys, uh, Janine, Adam, y'all have any comment on mining industry, where it's going? Beating the dead horse with bits main there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you need to say any note. So let's go on to the next one and let's figure out what finance is doing here. So 
This was pushed out from Binance just a few days ago. It's a tweet introducing the Binance Academy Glossary Bounty Program. It's an open source effort to reward people in the Binance coin BNB for helping define terminology in Bitcoin and the larger crypto ecosystem. And uh, the bounty period is it just started a few days ago and it's going through the 28th of March. Each approved submission will receive two BNB. The top contributor will be rewarded a 10 BNB bonus and the top two to five contributors will be rewarded a five BNB bonus. And I think I checked this morning, these BNBs are going for about 15 bucks and uh, or, you know, uh, what? 300,000 Satoshis, so around there. Approved submissions will be based on first come, first serve model. Each submission will be time stamped upon submitting and will be reviewed in order of submission. Once a term has been approved, it is no longer eligible for submission. The definitions must range between 200 and 500 words and be submitted through their online Google Doc. For a regular update on the list of the glossary terms to be defined, you could join the Binance Academy chat on Telegram. And uh, the BNB bounty will be distributed within three weeks upon the completion of this program at the end of March. I think it's an interesting idea to try and open source these de these definitions of these terms to see what the community will boil up and distill down for the greater ecosystem but ultimately they will still be the deciders to see which definitions get the go ahead. Although I'll say Binance has made moves recently with the addition of their research division and now this academy they are building out. And if they want to continue this trend of becoming the this big name in the space, then I'm sure they'll they won't just arbitrarily decide on a definition to help some short-term gain. At least I think. I don't know. It's uh starting to feel a little bit like we're on the edge or on the precipice of another blockchain mania with everyone questioning what will be the next heavy speculative asset. Ethereum's speculative value is waning now that it's got nearly five years under their belt with no real market solution. And we got guys like Justin Tron, man, offering free Teslas and 20 million in airdrops. Then there is this battle of the stable coins raging on, and that's still based off of different presumptive solutions. I don't know. It's uh, it's, you know, it's the tokenized world going crazy, but I mean, we do need some sort of consensus on some of these definitions. So it could be helpful. The next, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, what do you guys think about this? I absolutely disagree. Like, I think that, like this is absolutely absurd that defining things is just a, like a mob voting. Like that is complete and utter nonsense. Like you do not define scientific or technical terms based on who has the biggest group of people screaming for something that's retarded that's like peter Razoon, like going hey, twitter tell me what's wrong with the lightning network so i can go on a podcast and talk about it like if you if you have to go to a crowd of people to get some piece of information to try to educate people with, you have absolutely no business whatsoever attempting to educate people because you don't understand the things you are trying to educate people about. Like we don't sit here and vote on what words in the dictionary mean. We don't sit here and vote like what, what, what the term routing table means. Like the, the things and in technical jargon have specific narrow meanings that is not something you just vote on they have a meaning so you are either using the correct meaning properly educating people or you are just manipulatively distorting the meaning of words to push propaganda and given binance as a gigantic shitcoin platform i very much think it's the second I agree with Shinobi, except that I'm not that angry about it. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's an interesting experiment, right? I think it's going to be a failed experiment because it doesn't really matter what the mob comes to 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 define those things. What what really matters is that how people are going to use it, right? Well, I, I mean, go ahead, try try things some. Maybe we learn something from it. 
I don't yeah. think we're going to learn anything except that shit coiners are going to try and redefine words to justify nonsense shit coins existing. That, that's what we're going to learn. We don't need to do this to learn that. We, we all already know that. Well, then an experiment proves it, what we already know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, I'm just, like I'm saying, I think it's an interesting idea, but for sure they're going to be bombarded with uh, a bunch of overloaded definitions that aren't even really on point if there's one thing i know for sure it's just like everybody seems to say a lot of words in terminology in this space just sort of like matter of fact you know the decentralized one is just the easiest one to point to in security and um yeah it's uh I, i've tried to sit there and argue some of the points to define like what exactly these are to bring these things and it's hard. It, it's like, it's really hard. It's very obvious that there is a very small narrow band of people that really understand these things and the way they work. And, um, you know, if you really wanted to get serious about this sort of thing, then yeah, you would be uh, reaching out to the people that, you know, are specialized in the technology and not just like some broad feeler of like what you think it means and we'll give you some BNB coin. And I, I mean, I'll admit the whole time I was saying Binance Academy, it's, it's comical. It's like, okay, <laughs> we're learning how to trade shit coins here. So uh, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. I think it's interesting though. Uh, it just in the sense that, you know, they're going to get a bunch of, yeah, a bunch of gobbledygook and we'll see what they come up with. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm personally interested what they come up with, right? But what's the most popular way to define something? It's, it's not that not that uninteresting information, is it? But like, what's the cost of this? Like, this is just injecting more and more and more noise into the ecosystem that's drowning out actual signal. Like, th this isn't just like the, nothing is going to come of this. Like, mm -hmm. this is how horseshit and scams and nonsense perpetuate itself they do shit like this they project officialness that rationalizes bullshit and then point to that to draw more people into it like this is how it's worked for almost 10 years and like people need to react to this they need to call this out and just stop letting horseshit perpetuate itself like people actually get financially hurt because of this. That's what I'm saying. I think it does feel like we're on the precipice of another mania all based around, uh, you know, altcoins and blockchain and people are trying to get people jazzed about their particular thing. I mean, you know, there's a reason they're doing it in B and B and, you know, there's a reason why, you know, these guys from these other networks are everywhere trying to give away anything. And uh, yeah, they're building up the, the noise. And uh, when they do put out their signal, we'll just have to, you know, be very vocal about, you know, their signal being noise too. All right, so uh, continuing on, looks like we got uh, some more Tether stuff going on. Oh man, yeah, I've been seeing this. Yep. So, Francis, I understand better than you, Coppola, or I guess more, more recently, uh, Francis, you didn't read the tweet, Coppola, um, is now breathing complete horseshit into things yet again. And so, first off, let me actually break down the reasonable criticism or skepticism here. Tether recently updated their website and removed the language every tether is always backed one to one by traditional currency held in our reserves so one usd tether is always equivalent to one usd okay and now before i get into this i want to remind everybody of a little bit of historical context to this tether was using noble bank in puerto rico which was a full reserve bank to store the funds backing tethers. That bank 
moved to sell itself, which led to Bitfinex, or Tether, rather, having to move the money and find new banking customers. And one of the critical details I pointed out that almost nobody in this entire ecosystem, from other people creating content like this to actual air quote professional journalists in places like the New York Times, did not cover or mention to any significant detail the fact that Noble Bank had their custodian bank in New York City cut off services to them, which in the greater context was going on during all of the nonsense about printing money out of thin air and all of the bullshit about the government pressure from the CFTC. So keep that in mind that they had a bank that was 100% full reserve who was attacked and had their custodial bank just completely cut off them and snowballed things to where they are now. Now, let's look at the language here. In the updated website, every tether is always 100% backed by our reserves, which include traditional currency and cash equivalents, and from time to time may include other assets and receivables from loans made by Tether to third parties, which may include affiliated entities, collectively reserves in parentheses. Every Tether is also one-to-one -one pegged to the dollar, so one USD, blah, 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 is always rather, or, yeah, you, you get it. Now, here's the thing here. There are a lot of things that are cash equivalents, like bonds, for instance. There is an investment product from the U.S. government called TIPS, which can guarantee an amount of dollars with no interest. There are a, a huge number of investments and things you can hold that function as cash equivalents. Francis Coppola, with absolutely no basis to this whatsoever, is claiming that they are using cryptocurrencies as a cash equivalent to back this. There is literally zero evidence or facts whatsoever to reinforce that. And she is just stating it as a fact. And now every troll in the world is repeating that as a fact. There is nothing to actually back that statement up. It is 100% pure speculation. Now, as far as the loan aspect, that is something that there is legitimate reason to be skeptical of because there is a complete lack of clarity about what that situation actually entails. Is Tether directly making loans to people? What is the, the structure and nature of that loan? Is it contractually defined? Is there any type of collateral or property that could be collected to make good on that loan in the event of a default? Or is this simply new language that has been put in there to cover their ass effectively because they are forced now to use a non-full reserve bank? Which again, I, I will point out again, they did so storing their money in Noble Bank in Puerto Rico until the custodial bank that Noble Bank was using in New York City completely cut all ties with them. Which again, goes back to all of the nonsense about printing money out of thin air, all of the pressure from the US government. That did not just happen in a vacuum. And so, like th there is legitimate criticism, there is legitimate concern over the exact situation going on with these loans and what that entails. That is a legitimate thing to worry about, to think about the consequences that it could have as far as the redeemability of tethers. But this nonsense that they are backing things with cryptocurrency is absolutely just pulled out of Coppola's ass. There is not a single fact or shred of evidence whatsoever to back that up. This is literally just repeating the same bullshit that Bitfinex was as far as claiming they did not have banks because a correspondent bank blocked a wire transfer. 
that is literally fabricated horseshit based on absolutely nothing factual put out intentionally to have an effect on the market and perpetuate itself under the guise of being factual information. It is not. Now, if people want to criticize Tether, they want to have concerns voiced, that is perfectly reasonable in relation to the issue of these loans and what the exact nature of them is and how much that exposes Tether reserves to default. That is a completely reasonable, or reasonable and rational response to this update. But claiming that they're backed by cryptocurrencies now is complete horseshit. So if you're going to criticize something, if you're going to voice concerns, do so based on actual factual information and just stop perpetuating bullshit. Like there is nothing wrong with criticizing something in this space, but there is something very wrong when you base criticism on completely unfactual information, on completely baseless speculation and propagate that around as fact. That is completely unethical and completely irresponsible. Well, yeah, you know, man, if it's a tether headline, people are going to go nuts with it. And, uh, you know, especially once Francis Coppola says something, everybody's going to go double nuts. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I get you what you're saying. I mean, like, and uh, kind of going back to just what I was saying earlier about the battle of the stable coins. I mean, like these guys, uh, you know, they're like the original stable coin. And, um, you know, if they have to adjust things to continue to keep going, I mean, like I can understand it. I understand like uh, being speculate, you know, being worrisome and like, you know, checking out to make sure that everything is above board. But yeah, you know, Francis and Tether, those two together, that's like a tornado of, a FUD that's going to come out. So it's not too surprising. Yeah. And she's like a really big crybaby when it comes to people like challenging her. Like she, she has, she just has a canned response for anyone who wants to make corrections to what she says. And if, you know, if you try to correct her, she'll just call you a cultist. And then if you keep trying to correct her, then she'll start crying about how the Bitcoiners are so mean to her. And please, Eric Lombroso, will you like tell all of your, followers to stop correcting me on things which i'm interpreting as abuse it's completely ridiculous i understand it better than you <laughs> yeah that's her like go to i'm gonna piss off a bitcoiner today phrase so the, yeah the thread with um i can't remember who i, th I think it was dan and a couple of people that they were like they were that, cause so for anyone who doesn't know, there's like a wine company or something that's called Francis Coppola. And I think there's also an actress or something. And so people were making this thread like about all of her funny connections to like piss her off. And it was so easy because she just started calling everyone idiots and she didn't realize that they were just playing a joke. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw her Twitter handle for about a year before I realized it wasn't Francis, like some like Francis Ford Coppola uh, family member or something. <laughs> yeah, so uh, everything's okay in Tetherland, though, right, Shinobi? Oh, I mean, like I said, like the nature of loans that they're making, that's a legitimate concern that could actually have consequences for their solvency and whether or not you can actually redeem things like that is a legitimate thing to be concerned over to ask questions of and to want answers to that that is a legitimate issue but francis just literally farting out of her ass that this is backed by wildly volatile cryptocurrency there is zero factual basis to make that statement whatsoever. I mean, is she purely getting it just from the cash equivalent term? Because that wouldn't yeah. make any sense because the countries that I'm assuming that the whatever bank they're using is in, I doubt that they consider any cryptocurrency to be a cash equivalent. Absolutely not. Oh, that's just, it's, 
really stupid. Like anyone who knows, you know, the legal classification of these things would be skeptical of a claim like that just on the basis that cryptocurrencies aren't usually considered cash equivalents. Hey, good mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Should, should you have I... to meet like liquidity required, like an asset to be considered a cash equivalent. You have to meet a credit quality and a liquidity quality to consider that something like a certificate of deposit from a bank. That's a cash equivalent. A treasury bill is a cash equivalent. Bitcoin is not a fucking cash equivalent in the, the, the financial sense of that word at all. Like she is literally just pulling bullshit out of her ass. Shinobi, do you think that they're uh, adding this loan feature kind of in a response to this whole like everybody getting jazzed about XDAI and this MakerDAO loaning process? No, I think it's either one of two things. I think it is simply language put in there to protect themselves because they have lost access to the 100% reserve bank they were using, or they have started making loans themselves to actually try to monetize the reserves somehow. And like that, that would be a risky thing, but, and that could have negative consequences for the reserves and their solvency. But I also don't think that they would do so without any kind of contractual backing or making loans to somebody that did not have assets that could be seized and liquidated in the event of a default. Like I, yes, that, like I said, that's a legitimate concern. That's something that worrying about is rational, but like you need to approach these kinds of things logically. And I think what's going on is one of those two things. They're, I don't think that they're just backing Tether with fucking cryptocurrency. Like, that's retarded. All right. Well, yeah, sounds like it's more about just keeping the market structure in place to make sure that the liquidity is there. So uh, where are we going from here? We go from Tether to Bitfury? Oh, man. Yeah, so Bitfury uh, recently announced a partnership with uh, Hades Pay or Hade Pay uh, payment processor, which is a hybrid um, fiat and cryptocurrency payment processor, who has now integrated the Peach Merchant API. And so I think very clearly, like what they're going to just do going forward is just pretend all of the privacy issues with their software, the fact that certain types of transactions can be completely de-anonymized, like the, the inconsistencies with their explanation, they're just going to ignore them. They're going to keep a very low profile in terms of PR outreach and just try to do as much as they can to perpetuate their software. And like, you know, fuck this company. I mean, like personally, if I ever see a, a merchant using Hade Pay for Lightning Network, I will not be shopping there. I will not be using anything that uses the software. That, that is really the only practical way to have any kind of influence or voice in, in an issue like this. Your, your dollar is a vote. Don't spend it places that you don't want to support. And I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's really just unbelievably fucking infuriating to me that they just completely dodge all of the issues that were brought up, make completely inconsistent statements to try to justify or respond to it, and have just been dead silent in terms of PR until this announcement. Like, it's just unfucking believable Yeah, they've been real quiet since our, you know, little story and expose on this whole side of things. And it sounds like, yeah, they're just going to try and quietly launch this and see who they can get sucked up into this system. Because like we uh, said, you know, back in that episode, I mean, it's really a system just built out to try and de-anonymize the Lightning Network, which is, at, you know, in opposition towards what Bitcoin's roadmap is trying to achieve. And yeah, if you're trying to actually... Uh, you know, play this system in a way that helps build out a uh, a platform for people to actually hold their own value and maintain their privacy and all these, uh, you know, things we'd like to bring back to people on a level that's a lot bigger in scale than just the United States geographically. 
then uh, yeah, we should all be voting with our dollars to avoid the system of uh, what is it? Hide pay. That's what they're. H a d e pay. All right, you guys heard it. Hey, pay. You hear that? You hear like lightning fury peach? Uh, you know, run for the hills, opposite direction. When I first saw it, I thought it was Hades pay, and I was like, wow, that's a perfect name, Hades. <laughs> Spelled the same. Yeah, it's like you know, it's it's like this is just a general thing in this space. Like companies do unbelievably unethical, duplicitous things, and then they just go quiet. People forget about it and they move on. And like people need to stop doing that and <clears throat> stop letting this happen. I mean, it, it's unbelievable to me that all of these issues can be pointed out with their software suite. And just ignored a month later. Like, it just never happened. It just vanishes from the collective memory. And especially after they literally outright lie and made factually false statements to try to respond and downplay it. And yet here they are still trying to expand this software, making deals with other companies to push it. Like, th that's unbelievable. Have you noticed whether I haven't checked the Git repo for Peach in a while? Have they updated either the privacy policy or the terms of conditions since we last looked at it? I haven't checked. I saw it reported that they changed their uh, their terms and conditions a little bit, but I didn't go verify that myself. Just to give a heads up to anybody listening, uh, the episode where we covered Bitfury's peach in detail was episode 152, Just Trust Us, Everything's Peachy. Mm -hmm. So I guess, did I have any more input on this? Or... Fuck Bitfury. <laughs> All right, that's it. All right, well then, next up is... This I am actually kind of shocked about. Um, so two days ago, a number of news publications in this space have started pushing around this, this story about the, the Bitcoin mainnet um, Lightning Network birthday on March 15th. And, you know, it's, we, we've seen a lot of growth in the last little more than a year. There's, there's now over a thousand Bitcoin locked up in the Lightning Network with almost 40,000 channels. Like we've really seen an amazing amount of growth through all of 2018 and the first part of 2019. But like this, this is his, this is historical revisionism. Like I am seriously disappointed in this and seeing people do this when we see enough of this horse shit from B cashers. Like the, the Lightning Network did not launch on mainnet on March 15th. That is when LND entered their mainnet beta. Lightning Network itself went live in January or February of 2018 when C Lightning was pushed out and started to be used on mainnet during the entire Reckless meme. And as well, like I've seen in a number of these articles talking about the official beta implementation or the official implementation or the official launch of lightning network there there is no official anything with lightning network it is an open protocol being specified that anybody can implement no implementation or piece of software is any more or less official than any other and it's like, it, it, this is just like, our, our, come on, guys, are we serious here? It's literally been less, it's, it's been a little more than a year. And we're already completely just revising history for like no material reason. Like Sea Lightning went live on mainnet first. There was literally the whole meme of Be Reckless. I'm literally holding the reckless hat made for this meme in my hand that I got in Berlin for the, the hackathon that I went to. Like, why on earth are we going through this historical revisionism for no reason whatsoever? Like, one client was first 
before another one. So what? How does that materially affect the progress of the technology, development of the protocol, or the, the adoption uh, of this protocol by users? Like, how, how does that affect anything at all? It doesn't. Like, it, it has no material effect. And we are revising history now, a little more than a year later, for no reason whatsoever. Like, why? Why are we starting to walk down this path of just completely rewriting history to present one group over another when that's not what factually happened. Like that is a very slippery slope. That is a very bad direction to start going down because that is how we wind up with all of the distorted nonsense that we do between Bitcoin and Bcash. Like they have just gone back in their minds and rewritten the entire history of the last 10 years and pretended it, it went completely differently than it actually did in reality. Like people should not be doing that, no matter what the reason, no matter how insignificant the detail is. Like the, the, this, this presentation of the Lightning Network going live on Mainnet on March 15th with LND, that is factually incorrect. And there is absolutely no good reason to try and present that as the truth. It's not. I, like it, I'm, it's really kind of just disappointing to me to see this kind of like attitude or action out of people for no real good reason. Like it, it really bothers me. And rightfully so, man. I mean, I think that this whole idea of revisionist history is one of these things that's antithetical to Bitcoin. I mean, like this is one of these things where, you know, you can't rewrite the history of Bitcoin and a lot of human history can be tied to certain aspects in relation to the timing of Bitcoin network, like the price chart and uh, reflective towards certain decisions and political outcomes that can make history more clear as far as like actual decisions that were being made at the time instead of it being written by the ruler of the time. And yeah, it is disappointing. I mean, this is an open source protocol and anyone can come out and create a spec in Lightning and it could become the most efficient way to do things. And yeah, this whole idea of having this official source and, you know, it's starting to feel like, uh, you know, just the way we've seen the uh, LN trust chain, I know that one got you real aggravated in the way it kind of felt like everything's being monitored and controlled real tightly. This is not the way this sort of development is supposed to be built out. And, you know, for sure, it just is, uh, it's upsetting. It's also so kind of weird because the, even if we were to say that the official launch was on March 15th, that launch was brought about by the fact that people were taking a risk and using it on mainnet way before then, even though they were being told you should not do this. Like the people who are claiming this is the birthday were the same people who were saying, don't put it on mainnet so early. And then the only reason it ended up being on March 15th was because there was pressure to then get all of the software to a point where it could work on mainnet and it wouldn't be as risky. So yeah, the fact that that's not being acknowledged or appreciated is not good. On, on the micro, I want to ask that, is it really revisionist history or just a honest mistake, right? Uh, on, on the macro, I, I start to see this all over again, what we were doing in, in Bitcoin, early Bitcoin companies were all named something like, uh, like blockchain blockchain in for Coinbase and things like that. And, and they are getting getting the shit because they have these these specific things in their in their name. And the lightning companies chosen to to do the same kind of naming teams, right? See lightning, uh, lightning labs and a bit a bit it's gonna be more and more misleading as we are going forward. But that's the point. Like, this absolutely is revisionist history, Nopara. Like, like the, all of the, the these are media companies publishing this. Like, they they have to follow this space in depth because they cover it. That's what they do. And all of these companies covered Sea Lightning going live. 
they covered other people in the lightning space getting angry and telling people don't do that. Like they covered the reckless meme. Like that was a viral meme throughout this entire ecosystem. If you were paying attention to any degree to what was going on with Lightning Network, you know about that. Like th this is completely revising history. And like I said, for like no good reason at all. Like there's no reason to be doing this. It's like the marketing aspect, I think. But uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, no part, you want to respond? No, nothing special. Just uh, I asked, uh, is it is it an honest mistake or a revision issue? A revision, whatever the word is. So is it this or is it that? And and you you're not really making any arguments, right? You're just saying yes, it is a revision issue thing because i mean come on the first first newspaper that writes something that's just going to just get copied over and over and over again i see the exact same thing with wasabi when any article comes out then 5 10 or 20 more article comes out the, with the exact same misinformation so i mean that's that's negligence but but what what about the first one that's kind of the question here right it's historical revisionism like every all of these these publications these authors these editors like know this they know that reckless happened they know sea lightning went live first and it was a point of contention but all of these articles were passed through all of those checks and published anyway Yeah, it feels like maybe if they just labeled it like, you know, the one year anniversary lightning no longer became reckless, it wouldn't it would totally avoid this whole thing. But it does sound like they're trying to make it point that L and D was the first thing to go live and that happened on March fifteenth, which that's just unequivocally not true. And, you know, it's, it's really the last thing I have to say is it, it's just incredibly disappointing to me. Like, there, there's no reason for this except just trying to rewrite things to position yourself in a better light. Like, it, this, like, Sea Lightning went live first, the whole reckless meme. It was a big contentious thing in the space. And then LND and Async followed shortly after. Like, who cares which client came first? Like it, it's it's like it is completely irrelevant to the overall development of this protocol and the adoption of it. Like it, it's like why? Like that's just it's starting down a bad road that we've already seen play out over the last ten years. Where just one little incremental revision followed by another just led to a complete bifurcation of groups of people who are just living in completely different perceptions of reality and is one of them is factual the other is not like we should not be starting down this road like we should not be attempting to revise history for little irrelevant reasons that have nothing to do with the greater picture of what's going on in this space yeah and uh just like yeah i just want to say i can understand like uh yeah, it's something we should avoid, but these headlines and um, the way that, you know, websites pick them up and run with them and everybody's trying to just see what the story's breaking and editing as they go. That's uh, yeah, that's a bad practice. We should try and get out of our space. At least try and quell it down. So uh, if there wasn't any more comments, I could go into this update on Samsung's phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's just that. And then we got the no pars. Um being a neutrino right yeah yes all right so let's hop through this and then yeah too it's probably going to be a decent discussion yeah this will be relatively quick it's kind of a shocking little update so back in episode 160 we reported on leaked screenshots from the mobile world congress that showed the supposed supported cryptocurrencies in the new samsung s10 phone at the time, it looked like they were going to support bitcoin ethereum and a couple of token projects called engine and cosmo well, now, thanks to Colin Harper over at Bitcoin Magazine, we are getting a much clearer picture of what's going on with this new Samsung S10 wallet. 
the article to the the link to the articles in the show notes and uh you know i'd give it a read if you guys really want all the details on the way that it works but uh Colin talks about how he purchased one of these S10s and was expected to, and was excited to try out the new wallet. He went through the protocol to download and install the wallet, which includes some added security measures like not being able to take screenshots of the setup process. And uh, but luckily he filled us in on it. And uh, the wallet allows users to write down their 12 word seed phrase. And after confirming a six digit pin, then it warns the user to store their seed phrase on another device and that the Samsung never has access to your funds. So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty comical that it allows you to generate a wallet, but the custody level sounds like it scares them enough to bring that fear onto the user to try and mitigate the risk and say like, yeah, you got this wallet, but you should store it somewhere else now, at least uh, for the time being. So now another comical development is that the S10 doesn't offer Bitcoin support. It only offers a yeah. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, <laughs> once Colin went through all the necessary steps to his dismay, he could only send all of these shit coins quote ether, true USD, basic attention token, auger, chain link, Paxos maker, USDC, BNB and ZRX among others. And you can also add a custom token like you can for the online Ethereum wallet service, like my crypto and my ether wallet, close quote. So it also comes with the DAP support listed from the screenshots, Engine and Cosmo for crypto kitties and cosmetic reviews that for some reason need to be censorship resistant. And uh, yeah, even well, whatever, we don't have to get in that. As of right now, Samsung has given no indication as to why it chose to support only Ethereum out of the gate. And it has also given no promise or timeline for integrating Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies in the future. So this has just been a kind of upsetting development whenever we've been talking about this. Oh, you know, this finally this uh, this big wallet, this big phone company that produces mass amounts of phones everywhere. Everybody's going to have a Bitcoin wallet in their hand. No, they've got a shitcoin wallet in their hand and there's no way to send Bitcoin to it. So, uh, yeah, pretty upsetting development. What do you guys think? It's like I think this below. is probably. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I I just wanted to say that this makes so so much no sense that Bitcoin is barely usable, but other coins is just not usable at all for anyone ever. Like, like <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> makes makes no sense. Sam. It's money. Like I, there is no explanation for this except money. Like they were paid to do this. I mean, it, nothing else makes any sense. And like, honestly, like this is going to be really hilarious with HTC One's um, <laughs> Bitcoin and Lightning support. Like this, yeah, I, I, I think this is going to be a giant nothing burger for Samsung at this point. Yeah, wouldn't it be interesting? We're starting to see Bitcoin move all the markets. The politics are, you know, shift into where do you support Bitcoin or not? And the phones, do you support Bitcoin or not? We'll see who wins. Uh, I think people that really want to build out a new technical efficiency will probably win the day. All right. So any more comments or should we move along into the neutrino filter discussion? Um, am I glitching out? No, you were for a second. Okay. My my only comment on it is because I wasn't really paying attention to that development that much, but were they actually using the word Bitcoin in the marketing for this phone? Yes. Yeah. And I mean like So they lied. Yeah. Because that that's yeah, that's kind of what I was expecting. I thought mm, that would be a big deal for them to put a Bitcoin wallet directly in the phone. Um and so it doesn't surprise me that they used the word Bitcoin for the marketing because they knew that that's what everyone actually wanted. And then what they actually gave you was shit. That's so predictable. And it shows that they're too spineless to. You know, like, it right, shows. Now you're starting to glitch. <laughs> yeah, you're starting to wreck up on us. Sorry. They're after you. But for sure, like the Bitcoin word was the buzzword that got everybody excited. And now, like we're seeing the reality, it's, yeah, nothing too much to get excited about at all. Mm -hmm. 
All right, no prior. We got 12 minutes left. I want to get us into this uh, this issue some people are having with neutrino filters. Yes. If the B157 pull request gets closed to then I will start maintaining a fork of Bitcoin Core that has a hybrid SPV and a BIP-157 server. Pierre Rochard, uh, Lightning developer. Uh, this, this, this was news not long ago. And actually, I'm just going to very briefly go through everything because, because uh, I asked Pierre if he can come to a Blog Digest special. And, and he said, OK. So yeah, and I have. I have not 12 minutes, but I don't know <laughs> too. Anyway, um, what is what is BIP 157 and why would anyone want to Bitcoin for core, fork Bitcoin core because of that? Uh, it's the Neutrino client, the client side block filtering BIP 157, BIP 158. There are a lot of names that uh, people are talking about that. And this is one of the pull requests I really care about because it seems like pull requests like these don't seem to get into Bitcoin Core because no one, no one in Bitcoin Core, no one seems to make hard decisions because it's so decentralized that no one really has the power to, to really merge it uh, if, if it's just a bit, bit controversial. This would be really good because because this is how you do light wallets on the Lightning Network, and this is the only decentralized architecture, light wallet architecture, that wouldn't fail against network analysis uh, from a privacy point of view. In Wasabi, we are doing the same, except we are doing it a centralized way, um, which some Bitcoin developers would say that's the better way because otherwise you are trusting the miners. But right now you are trusting Wasabi for validating. Uh, that was it. I think I'm still in time. What What do you think of this? Yeah, I think that the issue, and like you know, not not to single out Nicholas, but he seems to be. Um, the big voice here like i think that these concerns are absolutely ridiculous and really are, are damaging to the network and, and software development like it, this is like what he's arguing is that an spv wallet is going to like effectively undermine user security by blindly trusting miners and yeah that's true but that has absolutely nothing to do with neutrino that has nothing to do with bloom filters like th these are just ways to get information from a node for a light client like that has nothing to do with the the trust model regarding trusting miners or a single node like that is completely tangential and it's objectively true that neutrino is a huge privacy gain versus bloom filters like, or just directly asking a node, like, here's my addresses, give me the balances, and having zero privacy. And like, there, there is nothing about Neutrino that requires that you randomly talk to a bunch of nodes and just trust the longest chain. Like, you can do that. You can connect to a single node like Wasabi does. Like, that has nothing to do with Neutrino itself. And this, like, this creating enough contention that BIP-157 isn't merged into core actively damages users' privacy. It limits the options that you can use to protect your privacy and makes it way more difficult to actually improve that privacy. Like there, there is absolutely nothing constructive about this argument. I don't think it makes any sense and it's going to actively damage users' privacy and hurt them if this creates enough contention that this doesn't get merged into core. And it's especially ridiculous because this is, has absolutely nothing to do with any consensus, like anything. This is all just peer-to-peer -peer protocol stuff. So I really thought that you, you would be uh, on the same argument as, as Nicholas is, which I don't agree with, but uh, 
let 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 me let me tell you how how it's uh, how it's it's how he's thinking. First of the privacy thing. Uh, let's see if you agree with that. About the privacy, it doesn't really matter if it's centralized or decentralized because the privacy is the same. So what really matters is what, what's the really real question is. Should we do this in a decentralized way or a centralized way? Regarding privacy, there is no difference, right? Yeah, so but that's up to the user. And if you get if you get rid of a node's ability to use or serve neutrino filters, now a user can't use it and gain the privacy, whether it's centralized or decentralized. So like well, you're, you're they can download the filters from Wasabi, you know. But but the real point is is yes. Yeah, but like now it's if any other wallet wants to do this, now they have to make their own custom software to do this. If I wanted to try and hook up to my own node using neutrino filters, like I couldn't do it or I would have to get a custom patch for my node or use something like BTCD, which is something I'm not willing to do as a primary thing. So then I would have to have two nodes now. I would have to use BTCD to get neutrino filters and use Bitcoin Core to shield that from potential consensus failures, if, if I'm really being cautious. Okay, so the argument goes not really against neutrino, it goes against SPV wallets. The problem is that if we have too, much, too many SPV wallets or SPV wallets become the economical majority, then uh, the Bitcoin network effectively can be forked by miners, only miners. If we do SPV wallets, if we don't do SPV wallets, but central validating wallets, and they become the majority, then the Bitcoin network can be forked by the central validating wallets colluding, but they say, it's still better because those central validation points are transparent and we can shit on them, but the miners are anonymous and we cannot shit on them. So this, this see, was the we, argument. That's, that, I think that's nonsense. Like one, if, if, a, if a bunch of wallet providers do that, then people can just switch wallets or somebody can just tweak the code of that wallet and send out an update and you can use a different server and it's really like it's the same kind of thing with miners if miners do that and everybody realizes it and goes oh shit they can update their software to ignore any nodes serving them invalid things like we it's like it's and 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 also i mean honestly I don't know what he's talking about trying to like paint this as a big worry in the first place. Like I cannot think of any like light client that uses SPV for random nodes except bread wallet and green or green address. That's it. Like almost every single light wallet out there in the world now uses a node provided by the people who developed that wallet. It's using a single node. Like that, the model that he's worried about is almost non-existent nowadays in terms of use. Like nobody's doing that anymore. So Multibit and Bisc was quite popular. But anyway, I, I agree with you. It's it's really like over-engineering, isn't it? I, I don't like the, the thinking there. What, when he changed his mind about SPV wallets where the 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 segbit 2x things right if miners fork fork there then we might have real problems but it turned out there weren't that much spv wallets anymore left on the market so it didn't really matter uh yeah so so the segbit 2x was the his 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 turning point but again yeah, I, think I agree with you it's not a problem like, I, I don't think over-engineering is the right way to say it. I just think he's trying to act like like a problem is there when it's just not there. And like I like and given that there's no problem there, like all this can do is hurt people. Like this isn't actually helping anything.
I'm just thinking like, uh, you know, yeah, the SPV thing. I mean, uh, so I'm just thinking like this whole neutrino server and you can connect to your own node or trusted nodes and like this BIP would make it to where you couldn't do that. Is that what you guys are talking about? We, we are talking about it getting into Bitcoin Core. So Bitcoin Core would serve filters. I'm just thinking about the SPV area of things probably wouldn't get developed out during that whole 2x time because it's like, what's the incentive if like, uh, I don't know, there wasn't the incentive there to sort of build out that trusted model because everybody was worried about SegWit and then 2x. It was still a time of uncertainty where now we are starting to see companies like Samurai develop their own node that you could connect to. And I'm sure it's using some of these uh, you know things in place that this might upset. Yeah, I think it's an awesome trend, actually. That's that's right. really an awesome trend. I'm or the hybrid, hybrid, uh, hybrid nodes, right? When it starts acting like an SPV wallet until it synchronizes the chain. For example, the node launcher from Pierre Rochard is, is that kind of hybrid, and and I think that's that's awesome, awesome too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like at this two hours, and I'm pretty much done with what I got to say. Is there any more uh, comments or should we go into final thoughts? Just that I would uh, really like to see that uh, special edition with, uh, you know, this uh, debate, you know, going on a little bit longer because it, uh, it does sound like an interesting subject we need to spend more time on. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, who's got some final thoughts? So mine's going to be a quick one. Next time you are ranting about Francis, you remember the tether things, just just specify which Francis you are talking about because for like 10 minutes I thought you are talking about Francis Pouliot, you know, the Canadian from Satoshi Porta. <laughs> <laughs> when I realized that annoying woman is that you're talking about. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. All right, Rick, you got anything? Yeah, man, I got a couple of thoughts for you. If you want to pull those up, it's just uh, the first one was uh, last week we were, our, we were talking about these uh, guys, the Bit Bros, who had set up a uh, LN node on their uh, car battery because uh, the blackout's going on and how they were trying to get a hold of the torch. It looks like they did get a hold of the torch, and uh, they were trying to pass it off to Elon. Everybody's trying to pass it off to Elon or somebody at Tesla – um, I know that it went to someone in Ecuador. I don't know if it's somebody with Tesla yet, though. But so that happened. That was good. And then uh, the second set of tweets was uh, put out from, uh, you know, Blake called our attention to this. And um, I think that, uh, yeah, everybody should try and put some feedback against uh, YouTube on this, where there's a channel for kids with special needs. And uh, they're trying to play this game of censored the comments based on the fact that the uh, – that the program matter is based on minors and uh, they want to say that there's a lot of pedophilia stuff going on in the chat, I suppose. But um, it seems like this uh, channel was actually a really good force for the special needs community. So uh, if we could get some help on that, that'd be great. All righty, Janine, are we alive? Is your connection still wrecked? Oh, and my camera is on. Good thing I had a sticker. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, my only thought is that, if, I mean, I've I've mostly been offline for the past two days, but I saw that I was added to a list of toxic assholes by Dan Tarkville. So thank you for putting me on another list that confused me for several hours. <laughs> um, and then I saw a shout out from... Uh, magical crypto friends as well from fluffy pony so thank you for that mm -hmm. and i guess uh my final thought is just reiterating like you know no matter who is doing it like let's let's not let history get revised in in this ecosystem like that is not cool and i mean that's ultimately just like there's no good that can come from it and there's only bad that can come from it. So let's actually strive to be accurate when we're going over the history of things in this ecosystem. But, you know, on that note, like, uh, like Nopara said, um, 
we're going to be trying to do a special edition on the whole neutrino issue in the next week or so and we have the normal episode coming up on wednesday so until then i'll catch you later guys later everyone bye